I just got out of seeing Black Panther, so I'm doing a vlog review of the film. As of when this video goes up, it will be the first Wednesday in March. I am seeing the film on opening weekend. So, it will have been approximately three, two, about two weeks, two, three-ish weeks since the film came out in theaters. So, I will be getting to this gives some time to let the story breathe, give people a chance to see it in theaters, first run theaters. Um, by the time this film comes out, it may still be in first run theaters. It may have moved on to the second runs. Though probably not on home video. So what I'm going to be doing is I'll be trying to avoid, like, I'm not going to do blow for blow spoilers or that sort of thing. I'm going to get into a spoiler light portion or getting into in-depth story discussion, that sort of thing. Moderately in-depth story discussion. So. Black Panther is a excellently put together shot, written film. The, the first off, right off the bat, one of the kind of elephants in the room, no pun intended, Afri or African pun, um, when it comes to the nation of Wakanda in Marvel Comics, one which has been addressed with varying degrees by various comic writers throughout the years, is where's Wakanda been when Africa has been torn apart by the people? You know, I'm just kidding. We're getting this written in our stuff to early. Hold off. Hold that thought. So, first off, this is a very well very well done film. Writing is excellent. <clears throat> the direction and performances are fantastic by the entire cast. Um, Andy Serkis is excellent as Ulysses Claw. He got very little time on screen in Age of Ultron. He gets much more time here. Um, and he does an excellent job with with the space he's given in the film. However, the I have to say, it's been said by several other critics, and it bears repeating here. Eric Stevens, filmmaker, is really the best Marvel villain we've had to be. Like, straight up, unquestioned, that a villain. We can is definitely fits into the category of the villain who feels that he is in fact the hero. But he is a much stronger antagonistic figure than than most of the other antagonists we've had thus far. The ones we've gotten with a couple of exceptions are antagonists who, like, either their motivations are a little weak, or they're building them as a villain to be redeemed and turned into an anti-hero or something like that. Either they're trying to shoot for the Loki thing, where Loki is the bad guy in Thor, but he's just so charming and you want to like him, and so we, we get these great team-up and buddy-buddy opportunities in... Um, or the Dark World, and in or Ragnarok, for example, or with um, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, where Bucky is an, an inherently tragic figure in that film. And yes, we also have Robert Redford's character and the other parts of Hydra in Winter Soldier, but... But the, the face of the antagonists and the physical force who our protagonists are going to have to go up against most directly is Bucky, is the Winter Soldier. And we and the, the thrust of that character arc is, there is good in him, I know it. That sort of thing like that carries over into uh, Civil War. In Civil War, it's, there ain't no good guys, there ain't no bad guys, it's just you and me and we just disagree, with the exception... Of not Arnim Zola. Arnim Zola was a soldier, with the exception of Baron uh, of Zemo, 
he's not Baron Zemo in this one. He's just like Colonel Zemo or something like that. There, there's Zemo. And he, his arc, at, his arc is like probably closest to, to fitting into this one, into the, the concept of the villain who is doing bad things because they feel they're right. And but just they are right there, but they are also in the rights to do these things. And I actually wanted to bring up um, particular Zemo here because it brings into the thrust of the film here, as it brings up because when Black Panther picks up not quite immediately after the events of Civil War, we get a flashback to earlier to seeing how T'Challa's father was Black Panther, or moving forward to just before the events of Winter's... or somewhat just before, during the events of Civil War, and then... No, not... And then maybe time-skipping a bit ahead. It, it's, it's unclear. They... We have a news article giving context, but the context is wrong. It's... I'm going to headcanon this as the as the news report is a recording, and go at it that because otherwise there's a screw up that shouldn't be there. But I'm not going to sweat. So, <clears throat> the writing is very well done. The direction is great. There are some very well done, in particular, camera bits that um, director. Skipping around here to on various sites to make sure I get names right. Apologies. And director Ryan Coogler uses you for particular bits which work really, really well in the film. If I have a complaint about it, there's a couple fight scenes early on. They get a little too bit into whip cam. Not quite shaky cam, but it's cousin whip cam. Whip cam is what happens if you wrap if not that you're jerking the camera back and forth you track the movements of a particular character in the fight like you're you're if you're watching a fight scene and your head is just and you're you're focusing your eyes directly on a particular character and moving back and forth and that sort of thing it's more i make a comparison to be like if you're watching a hockey match or a tennis match and you're locking your eyes head on the puck or the ball. You're still moving your moving your field of view around a lot, but not necessarily dramatically as much. Well, probably, for example, yeah, the hockey one works the best, where you are rapidly whipping your head back and forth because you're following the puck as it goes back and forth, but back and forth across the ice. But while it's your head's in the point in the right direction, your eyes will fall, just having your eyes follow the puck but your head stays pointing in the same direction. If the camera is your head and the action on screen is the movement of the puck on the, on the players on the ice, and a whip cam is where you just turn your head to, ref to reflect where the puck is on the ice if you're at half court, or, uh, mid, mid rank, or... I don't watch enough hockey to know the terminology, but you know what I mean. Um, whereas shaky cam is moving your entire head to follow the puck. So, Googler uses whip cam for several fight scenes in the movie. Now, whip cam can be less disorienting than shaky cam, but it still is something that can be disorienting. And in a couple early fight scenes, particularly in the dark, it becomes disorienting. Later on in the film, Googler manages, basically introduces some visual shorthand in the film with uh, adjustments to Black Panther's suit to give it some color highlights and that sort of thing. Basically kind of something like Tron lines. You've probably seen this in the trailer. 
that effectively take the um that that gives you a little bit more guidance for your eyes when it happens earlier in the film where it becomes disorienting there in the earlier soup design without highlights to draw your eyes attention and that's where you lose focus and lose the track of the fight and the action so these are also fight scenes at night and i mean it's he's black panther he's wearing a black outfit in the dark really great for being sneaky and stealthy less effective cinematic by comparison when black panther was used in civil war which this is also different directors that this is the russo brothers but when used in civil war his big action scenes were all in broad daylight, so this problem was less of an issue. But narratively, it's important here for this fight scene, there's this one fight scene where I'm losing the track of the fight, to be at night because it's showing some of the tact, some how the Black Panther, how T'Challa, and presumably his predecessors fought in the actual, um, in defending Wakanda. So I get why they did it. It's still a little rough, but I can forgive it. It makes narrative sense, but it causes stylistic issues. It it, it is the constant juggle. It is the, the the point of juggling for the direct or the, the the juggling is the wrong word, but the balance that, it, that a filmmaker has to make between the narrative of the story and visual consistency, especially when you're dealing with a more mainstream affair as opposed to making an art film. But yeah, Ryan Coogler shoots in very good film. But well, by the, get to the later fight scenes in the movie, everything tracks a hell of a lot better. Um, everything just works really well. And when we're getting fight scenes that are outside of... Like, like the next big major fight scene in the film, after that one, looks great. So, yeah, the, the, first, the first fight scene, rough. From then on, looks really good. As far as um, if I can think of any weak points to the movie, without getting into the brief spoiler section, and my weak point is really, really tiny, um, it is an excellently put together film. It is a very, it is like Marvel, as far as the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, has yet to really stumble. Like, there have been stumbles with the X-Men movies. There have been stumbles, numerous stumbles, with the Fantastic Four movies. But Disney as a company, and a Disney company, is in the business of making good movies, and they've worked out, I, I, I guess, they've had, Plenty of time to get the hang of making good live action movies. They were already good at making good animated ones. Now they've worked out the hassles for making good live action ones. With the, okay, pirate sequels aside, they're, that's still a mess, but I want to blame Jerry Bruckheimer. Um, anyway, that's a whole other ball of wax. So, it's an excellent film, definitely worth seeing in theaters. It is also worth, like, I also can't stress enough, in fact, far, far better writers than I have gone heavily in depth on the importance of what this film represents. Like, Wonder Woman was a really big deal because it was a female-led action movie that was really, really good, and a female-led superhero movie that was really, really good, and which also was good and didn't star Scarlett Johansson, that you could build, again, this group of excellent female action stars. We had a bunch of them back in the 80s and 90s. We had Michelle Yeoh, and you had Cynthia Rothrock, and numerous, and numerous other female actors were doing awesome action movies, and we can have that again. And here we have a big budget blockbuster action film with a cast that is almost exclusively black and is amazing. It is a 
fantastic film. And I'm certain it will do very, very well in the box office. And it provides a big bullet, a big thing to point to. If somebody says, oh, you can't make a big block budget, um, blockbuster action film with a primarily black cast and have it succeed, you can point to Black Panther and say no. During the footnote to this of it's also part of the MCU, but still. That's a big deal in terms of the history of cinema, in terms of how the movies get greenlit and business gets done in Hollywood. We'll see how this pans out. With all that out of the way, I've mean, been talking for 15 minutes. Now is the time to open up the gates for moderate spoilers. So, the narrative thrust of the film is the thing which I was hoping they would talk about, and I'm glad is the focus of the movie, which is where the hell was Wakanda for the past se several centuries? During the when the European powers were carving up Africa like a Christmas turkey, when Africans citizens when the people of Africa were being shipped off into slavery, when the Soviet Union and NATO were backing the various dictatorships or semi-democracies or undermining democracies in Africa because of their political agendas, because this democratically elected leader was leaning too closely to Russia, to the Soviet Union, or vice versa. Um, all this, that, and the other thing. So, this, and so the, 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 the question asked Put forward to this film, but the the fulcrum of the film's plot is why did Waka what what reason does Wakanda have to do nothing for doing nothing? And the fundamental thrust of the plot is basically Black Panther coming to the realization I don't have a good answer for that. There isn't one. We screwed up. We need to do better. And these questions are not just asked by, but represented by the character of Eric Stevens, a.k.a. Eric Kilman. And Killmonger is set up not just in this film, as just a guy who is in a position to be a rival to the throne, but as someone who absolutely represents this conflict of the fundamental nature, his father was a basically a Wakandan spy out in the field who saw what was going on and says, hey, why aren't we doing something we need to do better? And then... When we do better, we need to be a more take a more active role. And then when Djala's father objected and killed Eric Stevens, that that no, the, this is a this is a spoiler, but it's a narratively important spoiler. When Killmonger's father objected and was took actions in opposition to the to. Chaka, Paul's father's political stance and the traditional stance of Wakanda, we um, killed. And now Killmonger basically grows, uh, Eric Stevens grows up with a chip on his shoulder in the United States, knowing Wakanda's out there. And then he basically makes it, goes and learn and picks up the tools of Cold War destabil um, colonial destabilization of, of regimes. Not like nation build, not like regime change in terms of Iraq, but like like what was done, like like how you destabilize, how you use covert ops and black ops to destabilize a regime in a way that you can do it with a small force in an idle manner. He like previously he made his his job was destabilizing governments, and now he learned these skills and took on the job. That would teach him these skills 
to destabilize this government, to take the weapons of colonialism, bring them into Wakanda, take control of Wakanda, and then you then turn those weapons, the weapons of colonialism and the weapons of Wakanda, on the world. And that is a hell of a story, just on its own right. But what then makes this extra interesting is because we're coming off right off the heels of Civil War and where T'Challa is there. I did not have a chance to watch all of, rewatch all of Civil War. But when I was happening to be watching a clip on YouTube of the final fight scene, clips of the final fight scene between um, Bucky, Cap, and Iron Man, and then I also watched the final confrontation between Zemo and uh, and Black Panther, Chala. Like that really puts sets up where Chala's head is at in this film, where throughout Civil War he's consumed by revenge, first against Bucky, against the Winter Soldier, for a murder. Or the murder of his father, murder, murder that he thought Bucky committed, and now he's learned that Zemo did it, and in the process he's also learned why. The Zemo being consumed by revenge for the death of his family, and taking and similarly consuming um, Tony Stark with revenge for the death of his own family, his parents, at the hands of Bucky. So, at this point, the Chala knows where, Kill, where Eric Stevens, where Killmonger, that he, Killmonger is a nickname here as opposed to in the comics where he's called Eric Killmonger because we give comic book characters descriptive, ac actual, descriptive, real names, not just nicknames. Anyway, so we know where Killmonger, so the Chala mentally knows where Killmonger's at mentally because he's been there like a couple days ago both personally and dealing with someone who's in feels who feels very much the same way and who killed T'Challa's fa father and a whole bunch of other people just to rip apart the Avengers in, re in revenge for um, the action for what happened in Sokovia in Avengers 2. So, that's really, so, so you have Black Panther in a position where he is kind of, or he, he wants to hold back, not just because Killmonger is someone who has been legitimately wrong and has a legitimate grievance, but also because he know because he knows he's consumed by revenge and that's not good and he wants to help him because he knows that the revenge that the, the pursuit of revenge can and will destroy Killmonger. He, he's trying to be the good guy in more ways than in, in multiple ways. So there's that. Again, Wonderfully done. So, that part of the story is fantastically written and is right up, and is a really deep story. It makes it makes Killmonger again one of my favorite Marvel villain, Marvel Cinematic Universe villains. In fact, my favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe villain. And that alone, if you put aside the the fact that this is a great Marvel movie. And it's setting things up for Avengers Infinity War to a certain and all sorts of other stuff. I was hoping that I, 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 was, like, I, I was hoping this film would be great. I had high expectations coming in, and they were met, which is an excellent thing to have happen. So, those points. Um,. I might look at my one very 
tiny disappointment. So Andy Serkis does an amazing job in this film as Ulysses Claw. Excellent job. And the thought I had in my head every step of the way is because Zemo was captured alive in the Civil War. The thought I had in my head over and over again was, you know, Zemo is the iconic original leader of the Thunderbolts. The supervillain team that ends up kind of turning superhero and which also historically back and forth has been a super villain work release team, the Marvel equivalent of the Suicide Squad. And so when I saw this, I'm like, okay, maybe they'll do something with the Thunderbolts in the future. The Zemo, um, there's still the Abomination out there. They, they probably recast Tim Roth. They might bring Tim Roth back. That'd be cool if they did. But they might recast Tim Roth. They might not. I mean, they can recast Hulk. They can recast Abomination. Um, and like, okay, what other supervillains do they have? I admit, I haven't seen um, Spider-Man Homecoming yet. But from what I heard, they bring in the Vulture alive. Like, okay, that's three. So I'm watching so I'm watching the movie. I'm seeing Andy Serkis do an excellent job, Claw as Ulysses Claw. I'm like, okay, he's not the main villain. He's not the big bad. That's Killmonger. But he's a good number two. And this film's kind of setting things up in a in a we're gonna capture this guy fashion. And it's like the CIA wants him. So, putting him in a situation like, okay, now he finally gets captured, gets sent to the raft or whatever, and makes it onto the Thunderbolts team. That, that, that's the fourth person. And they kill him off. Which is sad. Because, like, Andy Circus, he has a lot of great roles in his career. Call him. He has Caesar in the current um, Pun of the Apes films. I'm like, okay, this is a great role for Andy Serkis that has him on an on-camera position with a little bit of makeup more than anything else. This is, this is pretty neat. Um, I'd love to stick, like to see Andy Serkis in the... Th oh, oh, okay. So, that. Other than that, the rest of the film is great. I do want to talk a bit more about the secure supporting cast. Uh, and in particular, the character of Shuri, played by Letitia Wright. Shuri is T'Challa's, the character is T'Challa's youngest sister, and she is a brilliant scientist, and she is basically his cue, as in the James Bond movies. Like, we basic, we, we straight up get with T'Challa a cue branch scene, where... Chala comes in before his mission, or goes off on his mission, and she's got, okay, here, here's your gadgets for you. Now pay attention, 007. Now pay attention, 00 Black Panther. And lays, and lays out all the really cool gadgets that he'll be getting and that sort of thing. And then a demonstration of one of the new narratively important gadget of the film um, in a fashion that is comedic and perhaps at the, the um, Let's a little bit of the hot air out of our protagonist, whether it's Bond in the Bond movies, or in this case here, with a little bit with T'Challa. And it's wonderfully done. And it's like, it's not exactly Q. And, and by Q, it's, it, I'm not talking like the new Q branch, but the new Q for the uh, Daniel Craig movies. I'm talking old school Desmond Llewellyn, particularly um, like when we're getting into. Late, um, late Roger Moore, where it's serious but with a little bit of comedic edge, to early um, Timothy Dalton and Pierce Brosnan, uh, Desmond Llewellyn, a uh, late Q where we get oh, tons of like little cute jokes in there, um, 
where Q Branch agent walks into a phone booth, puts a coin in, and then a giant thing inflates and squishes him against the side of the booth. Or person sits in the sofa, then the, the seat flips over, and the guy's trapped inside the sofa. Q sits down on it. That sort of thing. It's I don't want Shuri to totally just turn into a passive character figure, because she's certainly not passive here. She's plays a very major action role in the film's climactic fight scene. But she is as charismatic and clever and witty, in fact, wittier and wittier than Desmond Llewellyn. With, it's, it's a less dry bit. Desmond Llewellyn, because he's, he's British and official, and he's supposed to be your... And, He's working in a security agency and that sort of thing, and he takes his stuff seriously, even if a bond doesn't. But Shuri, it works really well here. It's excellently done. We have other great bits with um, the character of um, Lacoye, name horribly mangling, um, and Io. Um, or, or the T'Challa's technically they are to, they are T'Challa's bodyguards as much as he needs bodyguards because he's the Black Panther. It's more like we we additional operatives or field backup and that sort of thing. Uh, better way of describing it. It is excellently done. It. Like their their performances are fantastic. Um, they have some great lines and great action scenes. Honestly, the women of this film are really amazing. Like the past two Marvel films, this the past three, like the, the, this whole wave of Marvel films, the current the sort of phase from Guardians two and Thor Ragnarok, and now with Black Panther. We have some of the most awesome female characters in the Marvel movie. In terms of dialogue, in terms of awesome action set pieces, in terms of great performances. And there has been talk, and people's um, Tessa Thompson saying she'd love to see a uh, female super team movie. We had the, uh, there was a, a few little bits off and on with. Um, the Marvel universe, with the Marvel comic universe, female specific teams, sort of the Marvel equivalent of the Birds of Prey, and I really think this would be neat here. So, and also, of course, still want a Black Canary movie. So, anywho, I, in case you didn't figure out from what I've been from my praise over the past half hour, I wholeheartedly recommend seeing this film. Uh, as far as for the whole 3D IMAX or whatever thing, I saw the film in 2D IMAX. I did not have a 3D IMAX screening available to me in the area. Um, IMAX screening, this was excellent. Looks really nice on the big IMAX screen. Some of the shots, I can kind of tell how they were set up for 3D with main practical set plus uh, CG mat plus green screen matte painting setting up depth of, depth of feet. And that can be pretty neat. It's definitely doing the whole current tack for, for um, use of 3D in film now, where it's more about depth of field than approaching the camera. So, that is excellent. Uh, that, 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 I'm being effusive in my praise, but I'm enjoying, I enjoy this film a lot. But, that could be excellently done. I didn't again. I have not seen the film in 3D, so I can't see how it is executed. As always, as far as film brightness and stuff goes, your mileage may vary there based on the theater you're at. So I'm interested in your thoughts in seeing in what and if you've seen the film, what you thought about the movie, and for Black Panther two. Um, if there's a comic, if there's a Black Panther comic book storyline that you really like, please feel free to share it in the comments. I would love to hear it. Um, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.
you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and please click the notification button to be notified whenever new episodes of the show go live. If you really like the show, please consider backing my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero OR. Backers can view episodes up to one week early, and also pick future games for Let's Plays. Thank you for watching.